<laughs> I could just say that again. Oh shit. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> Uh, we this video is going to be how to better understand limiters But right before the video I said in reality It's probably going to be how to make limiters more complicated and harder to understand <laughs> uh, Which is unfortunate for you guys, but you get a look in the uh, Mind of the person that creates the protocols that torture athletes But it's an endurance sport. Unless the layout changes, but if the open stays the way that it is right now, you need an engine and you need muscle endurance and you need proficiency in gymnastics to get through stage one. So if you don't develop that, you're just wasting your time. So you still do need to get stronger. You're like way off in your strength metrics. It still needs to be a prioritization, but it shouldn't be your obsession. Well, we basically wanted to explain to people that they're going into the open uh, almost all the time. You don't do as well as you want to do. There's only one winner on the male and female side, so everybody loses. Uh, and everybody figures that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, everyone's like, oh, <clears throat> I did this test. This is my limitation. This is what I need to work on all year. Uh, they make that mistake. For, on so many levels because a the tests change the following year so if you govern your training solely based on what the one test out of an infinite number that could have came out was you're probably gonna guess incorrectly and i've always approached the uh sport from a limitation model so what's the limiter in this and i think that people need to appropriately understand how complicated limiters are and uh, figure out how to train them properly and I thought I could use maybe a common example of uh, one that I've seen people do incorrectly uh, to illustrate how complicated it is <clears throat> and then maybe afterwards we just uh, give a little brief rundown of like all the things that could potentially be limiters and how we think about it mm -hmm. yeah so sense? what's that example yeah so um, I think there were five running tests at the games this year uh, so a lot of people are working with running experts and working with conditioning experts. So something like Karen comes out or 15.3 with wall balls, double unders, muscle ups, and people get blown up in wall balls. So they'll say, oh, well, I need an engine and I need to improve my engine uh, using running because running is primarily done with the legs. And then that will transfer over to uh, wall ball capacity. First of all, that's just incorrect. There, there might be some carryover, but respiratory capacity, your ability to breathe is movement specific. So if you're accumulating a ton and ton and ton of volume of a certain pattern, your entire body is self-organizing to get good at that one specific skill. So yes, if you get better at long-term distance running, it will prove your cardiorespiratory endurance. It probably will improve your diaphragm's capacity to exchange O2 and CO2 because the respiratory frequency is so high, but it might not lay a local muscle endurance foundation and uh, the neural connections that are needed to improve high volume wall balls on a regular basis. There will also be some downside impacts to that. So there's people that do a bunch of running and then their Achilles tendons start tightening up because they're big, their run form's not perfect, they don't have enough time to do mobility and get soft tissue work. Now that alters their squat mechanics, makes their squat more tense, changes their torso angle, which then changes their ability to actually exchange gas in a squat and then actually makes them worse at doing something like Karen. So that's just one example. I mean, I think people think of run training in general and they like uh, as uh, engine off, training. Yeah. As engine training. And it's, it's run training, right? Mm -hmm. Like it will have some carryover, but it's running training. So I think understanding exactly what the limitation that you've exposed in a workout is so that you could appropriately attack it and not just mindlessly pour in a ton and ton and ton of volume that's not specific to your goals can be a detriment to your long-term performance mm -hmm. in this sport um i mean that doesn't even take into consideration just like you know run technique training and all the other stuff that people need to do to become efficient long distance or short distance sprint runners. But I'm just talking specifically about what we expose in the open. And I think that 
could be ton, you could use a ton of examples. People aren't good at chest to bar pull ups when it's paired with something. So they go and they get a gymnastics coach and they're doing, you know, slow isometrics and body positioning and body line work. And yes, that is true that you need that to be good at doing high volumes of gymnastics. But when you're doing kipping in high numbers paired with something else, you're talking about a fueling limitation, which requires an actual training adaptation for fueling and not just a positional adaptation and a strength adaptation that you get from strength work. So I think understanding that your limiters are more complicated than you probably think they are will set you up for long-term success, which is why I always tell people to find expert coaches or people who've done it before and kind of follow their lead and figure out what the best methods are that are out there for figuring out what weaknesses are. Yeah, um, going back to like the running example for a minute, yeah. a lot of people will say, I want to improve my engine, so I'm going to use running as a tool. Yeah. Um, and that can be a mistake because you're not always certain that it is um, helping improve you know, a central adaptation. It's not necessarily helping the engine grow because you're so limited with running mechanics. Like you said, your lower body fatiguing out. And an example to see is like you could get on a rower for 10 minutes, ride at a row at 140 beats per minute get on a salt bike for 10 minutes and do the same heart rate 140 beats per minute and then go run for 10 minutes at 140 beats per minute. Keep the heart rate the same for all three. All three of those are going to feel really different. Yeah. One of them might feel way harder than the next. Like like for me, the running, I'll have to go way slower to keep my heart rate down yeah. versus the rowing, I would probably have to go a lot faster and put out a higher effort to keep the heart rate the same. So point being is that those three tools are all going to work very differently in terms of trying to get the stimulus that we're getting out of it to improve the engine. Yeah, for sure. I, it, engine is a specific quality. So it, if, if you're talking about you know a 200 pound male doing rowing, assault biking, and running, a lot of things are gonna come into play there. On a, runner, on a rower and an assault bike, you're sitting, so some of gravity working is not against you because you're not on your actual feet. Then there's just, uh, your movement quality, what's your resting tension and your resting posture. If you're locked in an anterior tilt as a result of just too much sympathetic drive and too much bilateral pulling and too much bilateral squatting, then you don't fight gravity appropriately in a resting standing posture. And then you ask yourself basically to jump from one foot to the next foot over and over and over a hundred times, you're probably going to have an excessive level of systemic tension that's driving the cardiac system to have to pump harder to break arterial blockages that really shouldn't be there, but they're there because your movement quality is poor. So there's just so many variables that go into what people do in our energy system. course, we, we break movements down into, uh, global movements, regional movements, and local movements. And this is basically just the distribution of, uh, muscle mass that any given, uh, exercise is going to use. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you have to figure out with your athlete, with your athlete specific limitations, with what your athlete specifically needs to work on, what tools, what movements, if you're a CrossFitter and use mixed modalities, which, which modalities are appropriate to target your energy system limitations. Uh, and you have to realize that your fueling adaptations, if you're doing thrusters and burpees, you're improving your ability to utilize energy doing thrusters and burpees. There will be some global adaptations that carry over, just even psychological adaptations for dealing with pain, but that's not gonna have a direct carryover to running if you come from a background where you have a lot of volume of running and you have a good technical running mm -hmm. ability. There might be more carryover. If you're really gifted, there might be more mm -hmm. carryover, but I've always been a, a believer that you should be smart with your training and almost be like a sniper with regards to how you are picking and selecting your training so that your statistical likelihood of success goes way up. And I think the reason I wanted to use running as an example, it's one of the ones that I think is probably has the most potential to cause long-term damage in people that are doing this sport. We already do a ton of volume. You do a ton of bounding and double unders and box jumps. And yes, if you want to make the games, you need to be good at running. You need to be good at change of direction. You need to be good at sprinting, but people are using high volume protocols and then coming in and doing high volume squat based protocols. And then you see a lot of knee pain, back pain. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that could just be a mismanagement. If you can get the cardiorespiratory 
adaptations that you need in different ways without having to pound the pavement, it might be more effective given the broad context of the sport. So I think this just comes down to understanding limiters and understanding what you have to do to get better for your specific goals and not just saying, well, the best in the world did this, so I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna do that too because I have this limitation and they're good at that thing, right? It just might just be a false conclusion that you're drawing. Right, so where do you start with this then? So how do you figure out what the actual limitation is? And I know that's like a super broad subject, yeah. but something specifically where, like you, you brought up Karen, for example, which is 150 wall balls. Yeah. How would I look at that and diagnose, is it a muscle endurance, um, limitation or is it a breathing limitation or a, an energy system limitation? Oh man, that's such a deep question. I, I honestly don't think I can answer it in a short period of time. I don't think any one test can be used to give you a limitation answer. Uh, the MOXIE unit that we have here, it's a an infrared camera that shoots into your leg and basically tells you how much blood and how much of that is oxygenated in your uh, whatever muscle we usually put it on vastus lateralis will tell you kind of whether the limitation is a local muscular fueling limitation, whether it's a respiratory limitation or whether it's a cardiac limitation. But that's probably the only test that will tell you exactly what you're limited in. Otherwise, you need an appropriate body of assessments and then you need to look at the entire body of assessments, right? You have, you know, a uh, just let's say we're going to use the squat pattern as an example. We have a 1RM back squat, then how many of those can you do at 85%, then a 1RM clean, then 30 cleans for time at 75% of that, then a test with bounding and thrusters, a uh, test with thrusters in a front rack versus compared to uh, back squats. All of these things will give us insight into, okay, is this a pattern limitation? Do they need to improve their squat pattern because they can't breathe in it which would come out in a movement assessment that you would do or is it light loading that causes the problem are they really good at light loading but not good at heavy loading which is probably an indication that their nervous system draws on too many muscle fibers and causes occlusion so it's really learning how to perceive the big picture uh, more than it is knowing i don't think there's any coach in the world uh, and i feel pretty comfortable saying that they can watch one workout watch an athlete go through it and be like that's their limiter i think if you have that much confidence in your ability to analyze one test you're just blowing smoke up people's uh rear ends uh, <laughs> i don't think that you're gonna be able to to have somebody answer that question so i think that's probably as concise of an answer as i could tell you i assessing people appropriately, understanding the sport, understanding physiology, understanding movement, tension, the, the cardiac physiology, just understanding things will get you closer and closer to uh, knowing limiters. Cool. Uh, so just like we said, uh, we're not entirely sure that this is going <laughs> to guarantee a better understanding, but maybe it definitely gave you some new ideas and insight into looking deeper into the testing and assessing that you're doing when it comes to trying to figure out what is my limitation in this workout. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's good. Um, I think that this should be complex because the human body is complex. So uh, if it doesn't help you understand it better, it should help you understand what you need to understand better. Ha, ha, ha.